Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. Mayo Clinic recently performed the first ever shoulder arthroplasty procedure that used mixed reality technology in the United States. This technology provides surgeons a 3D holographic view of the patient's preoperative plan, allowing the surgeon to visualize, rotate, and interact with the surgical plan during the procedure. Joining us to discuss this is Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo. Dr. Sanchez Sotelo and the Mayo Clinic have a financial interest in Wright Medical Group, which developed the mixed reality technology. Dr. Sanchez Sotelo, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for the invitation, Sanchez. This is a pleasure. Joaquin, so things have obviously changed a lot over the last several months. Uh, we uh, had the sort of shutdown with the uh, pandemic, but Mayo Clinic has done a successful job at reopening and revamping the practice. Tell us about how it's affected your practice. Yeah, that's a great question, Sanj. Um, we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has had a tremendous impact on all of us uh, around the world. And I don't want to forget about all the many people that have suffered uh, in the U.S. and uh, other places secondary to this terrible and devastating infection. For me, um, I have been very impressed on how Mayo Clinic has made a transition to safety. So at the beginning, I was very worried about my patients not being able to have surgery under safe conditions and within just a few weeks, if you think about it, we made a transition to a number of processes that have made surgery safety. So that makes me feel good because currently we're operating almost as we used to do in the past, but with increased safety, which has made our practice very um, welcoming and secure for our patients. For me, the main negative of COVID has been actually the need to use a mask in the office, which I know is completely necessary because it's the only way we're gonna control this pandemic amongst the vaccine and, and other elements. But as you know, being a physician, having that element of human contact is so important and not being able to convey to patients your facial expression and not be able to read their facial expression sometimes is difficult. I also used to shake my hands to all my patients and that has become more cumbersome. However, it has had many positives. Um, because we are now more careful overall in terms of preventing the infection with COVID-19, I think infection will actually decrease everywhere by other agents, bacteria or viruses, just because we're applying safety measures to everything we do in our practice. And the other aspect is telemedicine, which we are were interested in developing to some extent, but I think COVID-19 has been like a, a very um, catalytic um, epidemic in terms of uh, providing that element to patients. So for example, today, my morning is all on telemedicine uh, appointments, which is very useful for us because being in Rochester, sometimes it's difficult for patients to travel to see us. And I think that has been a major positive of the COVID-19 pandemic. So right now, I think we're getting to a reasonable place. You've always been a pioneer uh, with your patients, uh, Joaquin, and trying to do things uh, innovatively and safer and better. Can you tell us about this mixed reality uh, technology? Of course. Yeah, this to me is a fascinating uh, basically, um, what we uh, use is tools that will project virtual objects to your eyes. So I have an example here of the uh, HoloLens 2 that uh, is used in mixed reality. And as you can see, basically it has a computer terminal that is internet enabled and a visor that you can project over your eyes. So what this technology does is basically project to your eyes something that other people wouldn't be able to see otherwise. And there is three different ways it can be applied. You can do what people call immersive reality, where once you have the visor, you don't see anything else. So you are immersed into a completely virtual world. You can do augmented reality, which is an object is anchored in a space by a software program and you cannot move it. But with mixed reality, you can actually anchor an object in a space and you can manipulate these three-dimensional holograms in real time. So as you mentioned, I had the chance to perform the first procedure specifically using right medical technology in the US and I was blown away. I, I can tell you that it makes surgery safer and more accurate and more effective. And also for us that love technology, it gets you even more engaged in your professional life. So can you, can you tell us, um, uh, you know, obviously you're a world-class shoulder surgeon. So you would typically, without mixed reality technology, be looking at the shoulder joint and doing your procedures. Can you now just walk us into how now, when you have the, the shoulder in front of you, how you're using this technology for, for example, implant placement? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you and I were training as residents and fellows, 
um, I think most of us were using mostly radiographs to try to understand where to place implants, and then we all transitioned to using CT scans. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem with CT scans is that even though you can create 3D renderings, in reality, you're looking at a two-dimensional screen, so it doesn't really give you a sense of perception of depth. Um, and now, every shoulder surgeon that has a high volume is using software to plan the cases, but again, the plan is then displaced in the operating room in a computer monitor where you really cannot see the depth of the space. And when you're doing the case, you have to actually physically walk away from the patient to the screen, which you cannot manipulate because you are in sterile conditions. So with mixed reality, the same plan that you created with your software that we are all using is now projected in front of your eyes, in front of a patient, and you can manipulate it with either gestures, so you can use the typical symbols that HoloLens uses, or you can use voice commands. So it makes the surgeon um, much better in terms of trying to translate your plan into action. And it's only the beginning because these HoloLens terminals are able to recognize the patient's anatomy. And once you can register with few markers, they can actually guide where to do the surgery. So my thinking is that, as you know, I love technology. It's part of our daily life. We have electric cars. We have watches that double up as phones. We have hundreds of internet-enabled gadgets. Why would we not apply the best possible technology for a very precious asset, which is our health? Yeah, that's a that's a great comment, uh, Joaquin. And when I when I saw you do this, I was blown away in what you were doing. It was like sort of Back to the Future, but in 2020. Um, obviously, that was for a shoulder arthroplasty or a shoulder joint replacement. Where else do you see this technology being used? I think it will eventually expand to so many other uh, conditions in the field of orthopedic surgery, which you and I share. Obviously, for fracture fixation, it would be wonderful because you could see all the pieces and how they have to come together. If you have a complex deformity, to be able to correct it three-dimensionally will help tremendously as well. So I think it will expand to every field of orthopedic surgery. Outside of orthopedic surgery, you can imagine if someone needs to have a brain tumor removed um, and you can look at the patient's head and see where the tumor exactly is and basically take your hands there. Or in cardiac surgery, you know, you have to be very accurate with valve replacement or other uh, procedures. I think this has the potential to help the majority of procedures that we do. And I'm sure that you know, for you, you're a hand expert, internationally renowned. I think you will find applications in your field as well in the future. Well, as you're talking, my mind is already racing. So uh, don't be surprised I don't reach out to you. <laughs> uh, now, now, another thing, Joaquin, is that you've, you've always pushed the envelope in education. And uh, every year you help run a world-renowned elbow course. But obviously with the pandemic and, and people can't traveling to Rochester, you did something different this year. Can you talk to us about that? Yes, of course. And uh, I want to make it very clear that this has always been a combined effort led by my partner, Dr. Sean O'Riscoll, and I owe Sean a lot. But, you know, the elbow team at Mayo Clinic, which is now five surgeons, when we realized that we couldn't do our annual face-to-face uh, -face course, which is cadaver-based, we came up with this idea of a virtual course that everyone else has been doing. But the challenge with a virtual course is how do you keep the audience engaged? So instead of doing just presentations, what we did is we basically booked a room, um, we booked a cadaver lab, and we basically had like a TV show where we were giving presentations, but also showing cases and showing real life surgeries. But we actually did live cadaver dissections. And I talked to uh, people after the course and some individuals remained engaged for almost 10 hours in front of the computer, which was very eye opening. Uh, so it was very well received. My um, humble opinion is that Face-to-face -face teaching is very, very effective. So I don't think, I hope, we will get to a situation where every single course is virtual. But I think we'll have the opportunity to do hybrid teaching where maybe you can do some content that people must learn beforehand. They can watch it online, learn it, and then the day of the meeting is a very dedicated, practical, cadaver-based focus uh, course. So what I see will happen in the future with the hand course that you participate in and with our elbow course and our tendon transfer course is that we'll have a hybrid of pre-recorded material that people can really use to learn ahead of time. And then the day where you come together with the experts and you really practice everything you kind of learned by watching all this pre-recorded content. Yeah, but one of the other advantages of the virtual course is that you're probably reaching an audience that may not have been able to, tra uh, to travel to Rochester. And so in that way, you increase the attendance. Did you see surgeons uh, registering from elsewhere in the world? 
Yes, that is a very good point. So that has two different ramifications. One of them is that because our course that we do in Rochester is cadaver based, obviously we have limited number of attendees because you only have so many specimens and a space in the lab. So this made it possible for people that otherwise couldn't come because we don't have availability. But also we had to realize that uh, around the world, there are surgeons that have less income than US or maybe Europe. Uh, people that work in Africa or South America or other places that have more limited resources and they really cannot afford the registration fee and the plane ticket and the hotel expenses of a course. So we had a lot of people from China, South America, Africa that otherwise couldn't access the content. And I think that's why in these hybrid concepts in the future, you can open the pre-recorded content to everyone and everything that is broadcasted live, and then you will have a smaller group of people that can actually come because they have the time or the resources to do the more practical on-site, face-to-face learning. Yeah, very good point. Joaquin, anything else you wanted to add that we hadn't talked about this morning? No, I just want to congratulate you, uh, Sanjay, because you do such a good job with these uh, small Q&A sessions, and uh, just uh, thank you for the opportunity to share my experiences with the Mayo Clinic community. I feel good that we have a safe environment where we can do surgery safely in Rochester. And I would like to invite any individual that is suffering as a patient that is interested in technology enhanced shoulder or elbow surgery to come and visit us because we will do our best to help you remain healthy and pain-free and active. Well said, uh, Joaquin. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Joaquin Sanchez Sotelo. Thanks so much for joining us today. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.